Well, we've been going through Acts together as a church, as you likely know, and we're in Acts 4, but I want to start off giving you guys a little bit of a recap of where we've been and what's led us up to the point we're at right now. And so, um, Acts 1, right? Opening of Acts, we see Jesus speaking to his disciples right before he's about to ascend back into heaven, right? So he had been crucified, he rose from the grave, he's been on earth for a while, he saw a whole bunch of people, and so he tells his disciples, he's like, check it out, listen, a couple important things. One, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses in all the world, but two, I need you to wait just a little bit. Go back. And just hang out and wait, because the day is coming, and I need you guys to be ready. And so his disciples, right, they went back, they waited, they prayed together, they chose Judas' replacement. And then we get to Acts 2, and Pentecost comes. A powerful moment, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Right, We know in the past, um, the Holy Spirit didn't come and dwell believers at the point of salvation before Jesus, but this is the point on where he does. And so we see the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles, and they start proclaiming in all kinds of different languages, languages they didn't know, and the crowd is gathered for the feast, right? And there's all these people around, and they're amazed that these normal common guys are speaking languages they shouldn't know. And they're hearing people speak in their own tongue. They're hearing people speak this this prophecy proclamation of Jesus, and they are amazed, right? And so these people hear the apostles, and they say, brothers, what is it that we should do to be saved, right? That's, that's the message we hope to receive back when we're proclaiming the truth of Christ is, okay, then what do I need to do to be saved? And so the apostles, they say, listen, you need to repent, right? You need to stop believing what you believe. You need to turn to Jesus, believe in him, and you'll be saved, and then you should go and get baptized, And they do. And so in that moment, 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. Such an incredible thing. And and so we move on to to chapter 3, right? And in chapter 3, we see Peter and John come upon this lame beggar at the gate, right? And he's like, man, guys, I... Can you help me? He's asking for alms, the scripture says. And what he's saying is, man, I, I need some money. I need some meals or something. I'm struggling, Right? He had been crippled since birth, and we, we know that he had been begging there at the gate into the temple for a long time. And so Peter and John, they say, listen, silver and gold we don't have, but I got something you need way more. And in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. You see, he wanted money. What he got was better. He got Jesus, the thing they need, he needed more than anything, and the greatest thing Peter and John could have possibly offered him. And so this man was healed in the power of Jesus, and he gets up, and he's excited, right? He's running around. He's probably jumping around. He's telling everybody about what had just happened. He's proclaiming this truth. And then the, the leaders, the religious leaders, are like, hold up. I don't like this. What, 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 what is going on here? This is different. And, and Peter and John, you know what they tell them? They say, you guys are ignorant. <laughs> Oof. You missed the truth of Jesus, right? The prophesied one that you're supposed to catch, the one that you should have been looking forward to, you missed him. He came. Not only did you miss him, you guys killed him. And so you too, you need to repent and trust in Christ. And then at the start of chapter 4, we'll read it again here in just a minute. We're going to read 1 through 22 this morning in chapter 4. At the start of chapter 4, we see the religious leaders. They didn't like what Peter and John were saying, and so what did they do? They had them arrested for proclaiming the gospel. And we saw that Peter and John stood boldly in the face of persecution, knowing that the world would hate them because of Jesus, because they saw the world hate Jesus, and Jesus warned them that, hey, guess what? Act like the world, they'll like you. Act like me, they're going to hate you, but it's worth it. And Peter and John knew that it was worth it. And so they get thrown into prison, because to them, any cost was worthy cost to follow Christ. So we're going to pick up right there. So if you will, again, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're going to read, starting in verse 1, I'm going to read all the way through verse 22 again this morning. So as you turn there, if you can and if you will, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word? Acts chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. How incredible. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, and the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Will you pray with me? God, what an incredible story of your power and your truth. Lord, I thank you for the example Peter of John have set in the boldness and their faith and their willingness to say that nothing short of your will is enough. And so, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this. Speak to us this morning. Change our hearts in any ways they need to be changed so that we can walk out of this place and faithfully proclaim your truth to the world. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. And so what we see here, you know, last week we caught up to the point where they had been arrested. This week we see that Peter and John, right? So after they were arrested, they're set free. And the leaders don't want them talking about Jesus anymore. So they threaten them a bunch and they say, listen, stop teaching in his name. Stop mentioning his name. We don't want this Jesus stuff spread. And what was Peter and John's response? They go, listen, guys. Whether it's right before the Lord to listen to you rather than God, you got to judge. But we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. See, we're going to obey God and we're going to continue to teach all that he has told us. We're going to continue to proclaim all that he has done because the world needs to hear it. And whether you like that or not, that's for you to decide. You see, they had a different perspective than the religious leaders on this situation, did they? The religious leaders saw one way what they should do and how things were going to go. They saw it a completely different way. Now, I'm going to go behind the wall. Every time I grab something from the wall, it's always like, I wonder. There's no quiz this morning, I promise. Uh, Mark appreciates that, right? So I got this board here. You see this? Can everybody see this? What number is this? Six, nine. You might, have, you might have seen this idea before. Could be a six, could be a nine. Depending on... Looks like a six over here. Looks like a nine over here. Depending on how you look at it, it'll appear one way or the other, right? 
People use this nowadays. You might have seen this little meme going around. People use this all the time to say, like, see, everyone's tr- everyone has their own truth. Truth is it's relative to your situation because this person standing over here says it's a six, and they're right because it's a six to them. And this person stands over here, and it's a nine, and see, they're right. And so it's the same situation, and they're seeing the same things. And even though they have completely different answers, they're both right. Baloney. <laughs> They're not. You know what the case is? Someone wrote this, and they meant it to be a six, or they meant it to be a nine. And so one person is wrong. Guess what? The person who wrote this was me. This is a nine. And so what's the deal here? You need to know the author to know the truth. Let me me try another one on you, okay? Let me try another one on you. Could be a G. That sounds like today's world. we got 54 different takes on this situation. This is going to take me 24 years. I didn't anticipate how hard it was going to be to erase my nine. All right, let me do another one. This one one should, maybe this one's a little easier, okay? What's that number? A thousand and one, right? You read it from this side, it's a thousand and one. You read it from this side, it's a thousand and one. Should be easy. Unless, for example, I wrote it in binary, in which this is also nine. You need to know the perspective of the author to know the truth in the situation. Is that not the same in every situation you face in life? You see, in any situation you walk into, your perspective is only correct if you know the mind of the author of life. He is sovereign, he is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, and he is in total control. That means that whatever situation you face, he has a plan and he has an outlook on that situation. And we must seek him and know him and his will to understand how to perceive what we're dealing with. That's how we know what is truth. That's how we know how to move forward. And that's what Peter and John are facing right here in Acts 4, right? There's two different perspectives on this situation. you got the religious leaders who say, you need to stop or you're going to be in serious trouble. So don't proclaim the name of Jesus. And that should be the way you do. We're the leaders. We're in charge. You have to listen to us. Their perspective is they are right and they should be listened to. But Peter and John had a different perspective. You see, they knew the author of life. And they knew that he had told them in situations like this and in all in their life, they're to boldly proclaim all that Jesus had done. And so they have a different perspective on this situation. And so it was worth it to be arrested. It was worth it to get in trouble because they knew that the author of life had commanded them in all situations to proclaim the truth. So that's how they move forward. You know, it's interesting because... Generally speaking, right, it's usually the right way to do things is to listen to the, to the leaders, the government leaders that, that they may be. Even scripture told, tells us, right, to obey the laws of our land and listen to the leaders. But they are not the ultimate authority, right? They are not the ultimate authority. God is over all things in life. He is sovereign and he is in control. And not just he theoretically is sovereign and in control. He actually is sovereign. He actually is in control of all situations. And so that should affect our everyday life. He is the ultimate authority for us. And so when a Christian faces a difficult situation, a difficult circumstance, they can walk through it without worry or fear, right? How can they do that? Why can they do that? Because they know that God loves them and they know that God has a plan for them in any situation. And though it may not be easy, look at Peter and John getting thrown into prison. Study the life and the end, uh, the end of the life of the apostles. Look at the life of Paul through scripture. It didn't look really easy, but they can step into it without fear or worry because the God of the universe has commanded them to do it and he will take care of them. We aren't here on earth to have an easy life. We are here to glorify God. Brother Wade gave his testimony last Sunday night, and this truth really stood out to me if you guys were here. You see, he was recently really sick with COVID, and he was in the hospital. He was alone, and he was struggling to breathe. Wade, I'm assuming I can say this. You shared last week, right? I don't know where he's at, so if he can't see me to say no, I'm going to keep talking. 
So he was sick and alone in the hospital. He couldn't breathe. However, he talked about that that God reminded him of something in those moments. You see, Wade had been praying for years to have some alone time. (laughs) For a little time to himself, a little time to stop being so busy, a little time to have with God. He talked about how he thought one day he may go grab a tent and disappear in the woods and just get some time alone. I don't think he intended to get that time in the hospital. He said a tent would have been cheaper. (laughs) But that's where he got that time. It was just Wade and his God and his Bible. It was pretty incredible. Wade was struggling to breathe. That oxygen shooting up his nose so fast that he couldn't even get a, a rhythm of breathing. And so he started reading his Bible out loud. And he'd get his breath. and His oxygen numbers would rise. He said that the word of God literally saved his life. Man. If I remember correctly, he said he read out loud the entire New Testament in the hospital. He sought the Lord's view of his situation, and his perspective changed. You know, I reference from the pulpit Romans 12, 1 and 2 a lot. It's because I love Romans, and also that happens to be a really important passage. And it says, we are not, be to, we're not to be conformed to the image of the world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? We must know God, we must know His Word, and our perspectives on every situation must be transformed into His perspective to know how to walk through life. And so how is it that that Christians have joy in any circumstances? How can we have peace in loss and in trial? How can we stand undefended in the face of persecution? How can we count it joy to give sacrificially? Because we know that God is in control. We know that his will is the most important thing in our life. And so our perspective changes to the one of Christ through his word. You know, do you have anything in your life that you, uh, you really care about? that others really just don't understand. So I I was thinking about this, and one crazy one I've noticed in life recently, um, I didn't understand it as a kid. Why is it that every dad buys a house and all of a sudden thinks that his lawn freshly mowed is the most beautiful thing on planet Earth? You guys been there? I don't understand. They're so excited. Like every three days, they're mowing. It's like, I think it grew just a little bit. So I'm going to freshly mow it again. It looks so good. Guess what? I'm a dad now. I bought a house. I have a whole bunch of land, a huge front yard. And you know what? Right after I get done mowing and I drive down that driveway and I see that freshly mowed grass, I'm like, oh, man, that's about as beautiful as it gets right there. You know what else happens that I have never understand? I used to make fun of my dad all the time about this. Sorry, dad. Everyone who buys a house also immediately loves the HGTV channel. Why? There's sports on. Why are you watching some guy put shiplap on his wall? I don't understand. Yep, bought a house. Happened to me too. Now my wall has shiplap on it. I'm just telling you, I didn't understand it, but it's true. You see, what we care about changes how we act, and our perspective should be changed by our love for Christ because He is who we care about the most. Consider marriage with me for a moment. If you get married expecting happiness and fun with your sexy spouse... When those things aren't there anymore, you leave. You aren't happy in your marriage anymore, get out. Get divorced. You aren't attracted to your spouse anymore and find yourself attracted to someone else, get divorced. Pursue someone else because that's what marriage is about. And if it's not there for you, you should leave, right? That's completely normal these days because from their perspective, those are the reasons for marriage. As a Christian, we have a completely different perspective on marriage, don't we? We should. Yes, I think it's great to have fun. I think it's great to be happy. And for those like me, it's pretty sweet to have a really attractive wife. But I'm telling you, marriage isn't the focus, isn't focused on those things. The the Bible is really clear, right? Marriage represents things like Christ and the church, which is a lifelong commitment, a covenant relationship. Through good times and bad, Christ will never leave his church. 
We're committed to our spouse and our marriages, and when we are committed to them, we proclaim the truth of the character of God. That's what marriage is about. When we raise kids to follow Christ, we're glorifying God. That's what marriage is about. When we are selfless and forgiving, we are imitating Christ's relationship with his people, and that is what marriage is about. You see, having the right perspective changes everything. And here's the beauty in it. You see, God's will is not only what's best for him, it's what's best for you. I don't understand how God could lay out the earth and that both be true, but he is so great. God will be with you. He will lay out what is best for you. He will reward you for your faithfulness, even though you don't even have faith without him. Because he is so good. And it's not because we deserve these things, we don't, but it's because he is so loving and gracious and merciful. You see, we just have to go to scriptures. We have to know the Lord and to know how he's called us to face each situation. Because God is in control. And that means there's a reason for every situation you face. Now, sometimes the situations we face are difficult because we made stupid choices. See, that God's also laid that out. Maybe he's trying to show us something. But I'm telling you, he has a plan for all of it, and he will use all of it to grow if we can seek his perspective like Peter and John did. And so the call this morning from this passage in the life of Peter and John here in Acts 4 is telling us whatever we are facing, good or bad, we have to seek the Lord to know the right perspective to have. And so I ask you this morning, have you sought out his will in your life right now? Do you know how to move forward based upon what God has commanded you to do? Because we got to be like Peter and John. And we got to say, no matter what other people are telling me to do, no matter what the world thinks is best, no matter the result, the consequences, the difficulty that I may face, I cannot help but walk forward in the Lord. Because that is is what's best for me, and that is what God's commanded me to do. He's given me breath in my lungs to proclaim his truth, and when he's done with me, he'll bring me home. And so what can I do but proclaim the truth of Christ? Will you pray with me?